and even somebody from Kenya who signed up to learn more about the five fellows and their visions for transforming local food systems through community driven change. The Swetland Center is an academic research center at the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University with the mission of studying the complex interplay between the environment and human health with the goal of translating these findings into policies and practices to advance environmental health equity. Food systems are a focus area for the Swetland Center. Over the past three years, a team of about 30 researchers and community partners have been studying food system complexity within neighborhoods in Cleveland to try and understand how we can change these dynamics to tip the food system to fairness. This work is part of our Modeling the Future of Food in Your Neighborhood study, affectionately known as Foodness 2.0. Some of our findings were organized into a menu of actions for community-driven food systems change that was released in November of 2020. And for those of you online, you'll see a note in the chat with a link to the menu of actions. One of the major lessons learned from this research was the importance of defining new goals for food systems within neighborhoods with histories of disinvestment due to racist policies and practices. Our team generated a new goal of nutrition equity for food systems, defined as having freedom, agency, and dignity in food traditions, resulting in people and communities healthy in body, mind, and spirit. One of Oops, um, this, the Food Systems Change Fellowship represents one example of this translation from research into action. Launched in early 2021 amid the COVID-19 pandemic, it serves as a test kitchen for incubating ideas to advance nutrition equity through community-driven change. Over the past six months, the fellowship provided support to local leaders to develop and validate their ideas while growing partnerships essential for them to thrive. All of this work is supported by our funders listed here. We offer a special thank you for their generosity and support and commitment to this community engaged research. These funders, including our community partners on the Food Nest 2.0 core modeling team have been thought partners in innovation pushers as we work to reimagine what it will take to promote equitable and sustainable food systems at the neighborhood level. If you're, again, if you're online in the chat, there'll be a link to learn more about our core modeling team. I wanna offer a special shout out to sponsors of the Food Systems Change Fellowship and today's showcase. These individuals and organizations provided mentorship to the fellows, advice to our team about the training approach, and funding for awards presented later today. If our research has taught us anything, it's that nutrition equity requires collaboration and teamwork. And we thank our sponsors for being a part of our team. And I also wanna offer a special thank you for being here today. Most of you are here virtually via Zoom webinar with a handful of attendees, about 30 here in the room at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Regardless of your location, we are delighted to have such a robust turnout for this event and welcome your engagement. To kick off, please feel free to introduce yourself to the room if you're on the chat by typing your name, organization, and location into the, the chat box. Our schedule today is action packed, providing a chance for each fellow to give a seven minute pitch, followed by five minutes of questions and answers. We encourage you to add questions for the fellows into the chat box, and we'll try our best to integrate these into the Q&A session that will be facilitated by the showcase reviewers. Awards will be presented during the last 10 minutes of the session today. Following the presentation at both one o'clock and two o'clock, we'll have sponsorship sessions. That's an opportunity to meet in a small group. 
to learn more about the fellows' visions for food systems change and potentially find ways to offer time, talent, treasure, or teamwork to help bring these ideas to life. In addition to the audience scoring, which I'll talk about in a minute, each presentation will be evaluated by four reviewers. I would like to extend a special thank you to Colleen Walsh from the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Food Policy Coalition and from Cleveland State University, Eric Fiala from KeyBank, uh, Dejan Brent from Brent Line, and Adrian Mundor from Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland. Thank you for serving as our 2021 reviewers for the showcase. Today's event is a celebration of the work of each fellow and provides a chance for that important next step of getting outsider feedback as the fellows ignite their future directions. You'll have an opportunity to evaluate each presentation based on these four criteria, the, their transformational potential for nutrition equity, the doability and feasibility of the idea, evidence of buy-in and desirability from key stakeholders and quality of the pitch overall. For those of you scoring online, you'll see a link in the chat to complete a survey for each fellow. You'll have a chance to provide additional feedback and share your contact information if you would like to connect with the fellow in the future. For those of you in person here today, you'll receive an email soon, if not already, with links to a unique survey for each fellow. You'll be able to evaluate the four criteria based on a score from one to five, with one being um, significantly below evaluation criteria and five being significantly exceeds the evaluation criteria. We ask that you provide only one evaluation per fellow to promote fairness in the review process. Each survey will be placed into the chat and live for scoring for about 12 minutes, so during the time of the presentation, um, and we'll let you know when it is about to close so you can complete your evaluation on time. At the end of the showcase, we'll provide three types of awards honoring the outstanding contributions of the fellows. These include the Food Systems Change Showcase Award, the Key Bank Reviewers Choice Award, and the Veal Institute People's Choice Award. So without further ado, it is my great honor and privilege to now turn the presentation over to our five fellows, Antonisia Harris, Lena Boswell, Michelle B. Jackson, Kelly Etheridge, and Marilyn Burns. As you are about to see, these five women are natural leaders and innovators ready to work together to transform our local food system. Thank you. Good morning. I am Antonisia Sharno Harris. How may I help you? When I asked that question, did you think I was prepared to volunteer? Probably not. Research has shown people of color do not equate helping others as an act of volunteering when in fact it is. The People of Cleveland Volunteer Corps is an organization designed on the principles of the food democracy system. We create pathways for people of color to impact communities in which they live. We do so by supporting food system leaders. We teach volunteers how to design activities that best leverage their individual skills and their desired skill attainment. In addition, we offer incentives to encourage volunteers to be active. I'm very excited to tell you about the People of Cleveland Volunteer Corps, but before I do that, I'd like to share a few things about myself. I consider myself a citizen of the world. Here I am in Spain, having a come to Jesus moment with Jesus. That little girl, that's little me. I am the daughter of parents who first met uh, in, 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 uh, in church at St. Timothy Missionary Baptist Church. They went on to become high school sweethearts. By the time I was five, little me, dad had developed mental health challenges. By the time I turned 14, 
Mom had been wounded by the war on drugs. She remained a prisoner of war for well over 18 years. What does any of this have to do with the climate change, the food system, and volunteering? Everything. People of color have a history of being in service to one another informally as a way of life. For me, it was my extended family, my community, and folks at organizations like Upward Bound who really helped me to make sense of the world around me. I stand before you having witnessed the impact of climate change on the food system. Mm -hmm. In Haiti, I saw poverty so devastating, it was difficult for my mind to comprehend. In Baltimore, I was reminded of Haiti. I can attest to you, issues related to the climate change and food system look the same no matter where one opens her eyes. What then is my transformational proposition? It has a lot to do with you, and that is more helping hands. I believe the people of Cleveland Volunteer Corps, based on the principles of food democracy, is what is needed to transform the food system. The key components to the food democracy theory is first is knowledge. People must have opportunities and access to learn about the food system. People must, have, must be empowered through training and tools to learn how to work in collaboration for the common good as a civic responsibility. I'd like to have a volunteer to read this. While she reads this, I'd like for you all to close your eyes and imagine what food democracy looks like. Open your eyes. Thanks for volunteering or helping out, whichever one you just did. I imagine myself in front of an audience on a stage, terrified, the first one up, but pushing past my fears to, in, to encourage engaged hands to join the people of Cleveland Volunteer Corps. In the first image, you will see one independently wealthy multimillionaire, two pilots, two executive level managers, one Ethiopian princess, two PhD students, and one girl from Cleveland. In the second image, you will not find a pilot or an independently wealthy millionaire. As a matter of fact, in that image, you will, have, you will see people who suffer from food insecurity, low wage pay, and the stigma of being returned citizens. I asked all 20 people if they volunteered. All 20 people told me reasons why they do not. I asked all 20 people if they would help me out. All 20 said they would help me out. I discussed volunteer opportunities with five food system change founders. All five stated that they would like support to organize a volunteer organization and manage such activities. How realistic is it to design a volunteer organization that incentivizes volunteers of today to become food system leaders of tomorrow? It's very realistic with your help. Let's talk about our pilot year. The People of Cleveland Volunteer Corps seeks to partner with an educational organization for the goal of uh, to serve as a community-based participatory research, we like to investigate a little further of what are the desires of people of color when it comes to volunteering and what are the needs of organizations. Simultaneously, we will identify five food service organizations and, and, uh, and citizens who desire to improve the food system. We will train those citizens and then support those five organizations for our first year, in addition to doing other volunteer activities. My friend Drew Christine is, a, is an established designer in Cleveland. Drew discovered barriers to volunteering and expressed her dismay on Facebook. Akusika is the founder of Africa House International, a food service organization that seeks to improve her volunteer activities. 
The people of Cleveland Volunteer Corps will work with founders such as Akusika to help her design volunteer opportunities for folks such as Drew Christine to have a rewarding experience. Translated into dollars and cents, the volunteer service of 3 million Ohioans had an economic value of $6.7 billion last year. Food system change organizations led by people of color can no longer afford to leave money on the table and the untapped resources of volunteers. With my eyes wide open, I imagine this invitation to, towards action. I imagine a call to people who look like me. I imagine people who are devastated and terrified by the impact that the climate crisis is having on our food system, but join forces with one another and others in the vehicle of volunteerism. Please come as you are Join the people of Cleveland Volunteer Corps and help us develop the plane as we fly. Thank you for your time. Do I stay for questions? Yes. That was a great presentation. I really liked it. You know, I've got a few questions. Um, the first question is, how do you know your transformation proposition is wondering in your community? Well, I've actually spoken with many people. I've done some informal research. Uh, I probably have had conversations with over 100 people about volunteerism. And initially, people say no, and they tell me lots of reasons why they don't. But when I continue to talk to them and speak about how folks can volunteer, and really about helping me out, it becomes a very different situation. And they always seem to agree. And this is very young people, teenagers, to much older people. I think that in the community where, I, where you see more minorities, the concept of volunteering is not as well understood. Although people volunteer all the time, they sort of think of it as just helping out, doing something for my church, helping my auntie, doing something for my neighbor, uh, and so I'd like to design volunteer opportunities that are, that are structured in similar ways where they feel as though they're helping out. Okay. How does your proposal build on other food system efforts already taken in Cleveland? Tremendously. I spoke with over 15 uh, food system leaders. And when I asked the question about volunteering, it, it, the conversation goes flat. Oh, we need more people. I've spoken to some of my fellows and I said, you know, what do you have going on? Oh, we need people to do this. We need people to do that. There's always this need for more volunteers. Then you have some frustration on the part of the food system leaders because they are, they, it, it's, they're managing a business or managing an organization to then expect them to also manage people as volunteers can be a little bit of a daunting task. So I see myself as somewhere in the middle uh, in addition, I'll be honest with you, some of the food system leaders, when I asked about their volunteerism, they don't really know what to have people do. I've seen some that have horrible websites, but they're asking for people to help put uh, seeds in the ground. This person could use help with the website. This person could use help with QuickBooks. Many of these people are missing out on grant opportunities and other opportunities because they don't have the best bookkeeping. Uh, and so I think that the, what we need to do is to really strengthen their organization so that they can actually apply and be awarded some of the funds that are available. Okay. How would you know you have succeeded? I will know I succeeded when, when I see more people having general conversations about their volunteer experience and how they spend their time. When in the grocery store, people connect and say, oh, I remember you, we worked at Africa House. Oh, I remember you, we did this together. That's when I know that I've succeeded, when volunteering becomes a part of the daily conversation. Okay. How, what would you say to people that are skeptical about your idea of being impactful in the community? I would invite them to come out into the community with me. 
I would invite them to uh, give me a list of their friends that I could call to invite them to come and do some type of volunteer activity so mm -hmm. that they can understand that it is beyond just giving to others. When you volunteer, you also give to yourself. What would you say is your biggest obstacle you're facing? I don't have, I, I can't, I, I, I don't think of this as an obstacle. I think of this as you ask, someone says no, then you talk to them and you ask someone else and they say no. So I don't think that the obstacle uh, in, in that exists. I think perhaps if there is an obstacle, it would be COVID. It would be COVID-19 because what I'm talking about is to, to create situations where people can engage intergenerationally, where people can engage based on skill, different skill levels. I show the picture of, of the two groups that I was members of. The one group we were in Ethiopia and we were going to Dubai. The other group was at a, uh, a kid's birthday party. When we talk about diversity, so often I hear diversity based on race, which I think is very basic. You had diversity of skill set in that particular group. And I think that the, the first group, people who are very established, could really be beneficial to folks who are not, more than just achieving some type of goal based on the volunteering, but leading to career paths, leading to more people of color in the pipeline as food system leaders. We have to have ways in which folks can be educated and then invited to be a part of this system. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Am I waiting on my screen? I have a second. Are we ready? Greetings. Today, I invite you on a journey into my world. This is not a project, it's an experience. And I'm gonna start with a libation. I am the dreams of my ancestors. I honor them for paving the way and showing up as the standard bearers of civilization. And to quote the book, Farming Wild Black by Leah Penniman, to my ancestral grandmothers who braided seeds in their hair before being forced to board transatlantic slave ships, believing against the odds in a future of sovereignty on land. The ancestors, Resilient act of agency helped to seed the nation's food system. Because of them, I am Ubuntu. Greetings, my name is Lena Boswell and I'm an activist, farmer, artist, musician, and I love black people. I have traveled the country breaking bread and strategizing with the most brilliant black people on the planet. Together, we've created a new narrative, a new language and focus, which is black food and land sovereignty. My work is lovingly informed by Black genius. As I unlearn and relearn, I will fight, hence the fatigues, to challenge the dominant narrative of lack and limitation wherever I find it. This journey includes generating ideas around the creation of a community wellness initiative called the Soil to Soul Food Web, cultivating the community to grow into their purpose. It literally starts with a seed a seed of inspiration and the curation of a new black and green renaissance. And here's the story of the black seed. And I think my panelists over there have the seeds. Now, you look, when you look at that seed, it doesn't look like much, right? Just a mere speck. You might even think, how insignificant. Now, what you don't see is the potential 
and possibilities of what that seed has to offer. What this black seed needs is the right conditions, environment, and nature to grow. Sunlight, water, darkness activate the soul of the seed to become what it is. It already knows what it is deep within. It doesn't want to become anything else but itself. At the appointed time, it breaks the shell, becomes completely undone, sprouts and reaches toward the light. It will go through trials that will make it stronger. Left to mature, it will bear fruit that will bear seeds to continue the legacy. We are seeds. Given the right environment, we too can have our own breakthrough and spring forth to give the world our gifts. This is, there is something inherent within all of us that only we can give to the planet. This is why place and environment matters in nature and in our communities. As I see it, we have two major challenges in the Huff community where I live. The life expectancy is 25 years less than the life expectancy of our suburban neighbors in Lyndhurst, which is only eight miles away. Also, 80% of people live in cities, and yet only 2% of our food is grown locally where they live. So how were Black communities cultivated to experience such poor results in health outcomes and mortality? Consider this quote from Farming uh, While Black. Racism is built into the DNA of the US food system beginning with the genocidal land theft from ind indigenous people, continuing with the kidnapping of our ancestors from the shores of West Africa, forced agricultural labor, morphing into convict leasing, migrant worker programs, and maturing into its current state where farm management is among the whitest professions. Farm labor is predominantly brown and exploited, and people of color disproportionately live in food apartheid neighborhoods and suffer from diet related illness. This system is built on stolen land, stolen labor and needs of redesign. We must recognize that the land and food have been used as a weapon to keep black people oppressed and recognize also that land and food are essential to liberation for black people. He who controls the food controls the people. The soil to soul food web offers a remedy. PLANT is the acronym, and it stands for People, Land, Access, Nutrition, and Transformation. Soil to Soul elevates the contributions of African indigenous agricultural scholarship over thousands of years. This plan inspires us to reclaim our rightful place of dignified agency in the food system. It is a comprehensive plan for creating a culture of wellness based on the Blue Zone project. It includes building a workforce to assist with the demands of local production on our farms and gardens and producing a value added product while cultivating our communities as their own economic engine. We are planning an aggregation upscale of gardens and farms, increasing access to local grown produce, supporting local growers and reducing dependence upon charity food rescue models. A youth summer employment program and partnership with Youth Opportunities Unlimited. An adult community service workforce partnering with the Court Community Service Program, offering an honorable community service experience as opposed to being shamed on the highway in a neon jacket picking up trash. Last but certainly not least, we support opportunities for Black joy and community engagement, which is a necessary element of healing our trauma-based experiences. We will produce the first Black to the Land Natural Living Festival, where we shall share skills and support thriving while Black. Please keep in mind that the healing of our beautiful Black community does not have a deadline or expiration date. This work is ongoing. We are sowing seeds, new seeds of sovereignty, the ancestors say you don't harvest the same day you plant. Owning our own land, growing our own food, educating our own youth, participating in our own health care and justice systems is a source of real power and dignity. While the land was the scene of the crime, she was never the criminal. And that's from Farming Wild Black. There is no culture without agriculture. Karen Washington of Black Urban Growers says, our power is in the soil. 
the land, the earth. Our skin hues are a testament to our belonging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lena, that was wonderful. Um, <laughs> so I guess to start, how will we know that your transformation proposition is wanted in your community? How do you know people wanna grow food where they live? Well, you know, it's a growing trend. I've been all over the country um, fellowshipping with uh, people who understand that we must be in control of our food systems. And I've also created food systems in my neighborhood. Um, and I, I am a firm believer that if you build it, they will come. And, you know, sometimes the communities really kind of don't know what they need, you know, because our communities are under siege. They're uh, suffering from trauma. And at this point, they kind of really don't know what is out there for them. So we give them hope by building these food systems and sharing the food, and then they, they come on board. So how does this proposal in particular build on other food system efforts already taking place here in Cleveland? Well, it supports those efforts. It's, it's another piece to the puzzle. Um, I'm a firm believer in local food. You know, local food doesn't have to travel much as opposed to the food that comes from all over the country, about 1,500 miles away. Um, the quality of that food is not as good as the food that can be grown right around the corner. And we literally in our communities can have food systems right around the corner from where the people live. So how will you know that you have succeeded in this effort? Well, I think um, what we wanna measure is we wanna measure the health outcomes. You know, we know that people are dying by the forkful. You know, much of their food that they're eating is, um, a lot of junk food. There's an inundation of a lot of junk food and fast food restaurants in the community. And we want to offer something a bit different because we know, I mean, the studies show that eating healthy food grown locally with high nutrition helps to reverse a lot of the diseases. I work in a hospital and you'd be surprised <laughs> what kind of food the people order through uh, the service that we provide. It's, it's astronomical, but I would tell you that probably most of those people are in there because of the food choices they make. So I'm sure, I mean, the studies show that eating healthy changes health outcomes. And so this is what I, I look forward to. Very good. Um, what do you say to people who might be skeptical about whether your vision will make a difference or the capacity to do it in Cleveland where our weather isn't always great? Well, you know, we um, have, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, we grew up um, pretty much uh, off the radar in our community. You know, our communities, because I grew up in the 50s. And so we were known for having uh, beautifully manicured lawn in the front and the parties in the backyard <laughs> where the collard greens and the tomatoes and the peppers were, you know? So again, we're off the radar. You know, we didn't do this for accolades. We do this for, we did this for survival mm -hmm. and to supplement, you know, our, our food system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that people are returning to that, you know, with, in the time of COVID, um, I, it was hard for me to even get seeds as a farmer. Yeah. And that scared me. That really scared me. I called several companies and they said, we're not even taking orders because they were giving the seeds to the commercial growers, you know, who really, you know, don't feed the people, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I even found out that a lot of the food that they were growing, they had to plow under because they couldn't sell it because of COVID. So switching to a more local system to me is the answer. You know, because we have better control over that. Yep, definitely. Okay. Um, so who are your partners and what is motivating them to engage in this work? Uh, my partners are who I, I talked about. They're community partners um, who are already in the food space, who are already growing food. And so we have decided that we want to come together to build upon our uh, partnership and our relationship to see just how well we can feed the people. I have an idea that each ward can be its own economic engine. And each ward could really, because we have vacant land, 
When I first started this 12 years ago, we had over 3,300 acres of land, vacant land in the community. I am sure that that has increased <laughs> at this point. Um, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but I know for a fact it's increased. Um, on my street alone, I think there are probably at least 10 lots that we could take over and, and grow food on. Um, so, you know, it's making better use of that land and offering the people a food, uh, food source. A wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let me give me one second to figure this out. So which arrow do I use? Hit the, the bar. Okay, great. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, we need to do a little activity. So show of hands. How many of you ever had parents say to you, money doesn't grow on trees? Hello, okay. Money doesn't grow on trees. That was my dad's mantra. If you left the lights on and you weren't in the room, money doesn't grow on trees. If you open the fridge while you poured, left it open while you poured your juice, money doesn't grow on trees. So when I had the opportunity to work with Sweatland around food systems change, for some reason that came into my mind. So I thought if money doesn't grow on trees, can money grow from trees, from the earth, from bushes to enact systems change? My concept is seeds to shelves, which is um, a model for growing nutrition equity and economic sovereignty in historically redlined neighborhoods. By way of introduction, my name is Michelle B. Jackson and the B stands for nothing. I just needed a middle initial, so I chose the B. And it works, which is why I insist on using it. Um, I'm a community organizer and a professional agitator. Um, I have co-founded, I'm a recovering professional chef. <laughs> I call it recovering because once you step away, it's like you really do have to reorientate yourself. But I am a former chef. I co-founded a political action committee in Ward 4, which is centered on voting activation, education, leadership development. And finally, I'm a resident of Shaker Buckeye, which is what brings me here today. Shaker Buckeye is a neighborhood in Cleveland that is historically red, is a historically red line neighborhood. And by that, it really means it, it's, it was a, a government plan <laughs> to literally cluster pe black people in neighborhoods and then label them, literally draw a red line around it. And these neighborhoods were intentionally disinvested in and no interest in them. Uh, one of my colleagues at Swetland kind of told me when the act happened. So there was, in the, after the Great Depression, Congress established this entity that literally drew red lines. <laughs> So this map is an overlay of a map from the 1940s through this homeowners, um, it's called Hulk, Homeowners Loan Corporation. And if you can see on the guide that anything in red was deemed hazardous for investment. That same map, if you look at today and overlay it, it's almost identical. That's most, and it's practically all of Cleveland. Buckeye Shaker, I call it exhaustion. You know, I, I try not to make judgments because as other ladies have spoken before me, these neighborhoods are exhausted, but yet you still have this spirit of wanting to, to move forward. I call it a war zone. I took these pictures, the one to your, let's see, it's my right, so it's your left. That literally, I took that picture on Buckeye, which is our commercial district. Next to that is our community development corporation. <laughs> And this is before it's now out of business for a variety of reasons. And that'll be a whole other lecture <laughs> if you'd like to join. Um, but that is what this looks like. They're on the commercial strip, supposed to be about developing the community, both economically and housing and all that. Lack of, so this is, these, this is what we're facing. Seeds to shelves will help residents of historically red line neighborhoods grow nutrition and economic sovereignty. I envision the operation of a mobile farmer's market and a culinary business incubator. The model looks like by having access to fresh, and I call it culturally cultivated produce, 
One of the things I learned from talking to community, as well as I must say, Miss Marilyn here, that oftentimes food that comes from the food bank, it's product that nobody wants. They don't know what to do with it. So when I say culturally curated, then the, the, the community will have a say so on what they want. It's a local growers collaborative. It will, they will supply what I, what I want to vision as a mobile food truck and we'll use the growers to grow what people want to eat. Boom, shelves onto shelves. These are examples of what that could look like. We'll bring culturally curated pure produce to the people. And then the other piece, which is a longer range, uh, which is maybe a three to five year proposition, is to build a culinary business incubator. That's where people can develop products and services, scale them and launch. And I am obsessed with Central Kitchen and the Cleveland Culinary Launch Kitchen. And so whether they know it or not, they hear it here first, I will be partnering with them. Okay, what I bring to the table, um, I really am good at building relationships <laughs> and motivating people. I'm an army brat and once an army brat, always an army brat. And what that means is that I'm used to code switching. So I'm comfortable in the boardroom, I'm comfortable on the basketball court, seamless. My next steps are, I really need to solidify a business plan. It's underway. I'm constantly learning this, this six months was very quick from where we started to where we ended up. By oh, listening, I changed directions a couple of times. So I need to sort of integrate that. I also need to do more focus groups. I've talked to a lot of growers and businesses and people who are professionals at doing in either of these seats to shelves. However, I need to get more community grassroots engagement and that's gonna require some focus groups around town. Um, Buckeye Shaker is, it's a big neighborhood and there's all kinds of different people, different opinions. I need to do that. How you can help, <laughs> uh, money, money, money. So focus groups, I think for, for developing the collaboration with the farm growers, we really need to have a really good solid website I've been invited to go and do some on-site training with some of these mobile trucks that are very successful. Um, of course, there's always technical, legal, business plans, social media support, operations. I'm bright, but I'm not quite that bright. Um, and that is Seeds to Shelves. I wanna say one other thing. Seeds to Shelves is intended to, to impact holistically the food system. So for me, that means, um, it has to be an economic component to it that these things don't exist in a vacuum. So the health disparities that we talk about, these don't exist in a vacuum and it all comes back to having opportunity. Seeds to shells will do that. Um, I also want you to think back to that picture of the Buckeye Development Corporation. That's where I wanna put the incubator. <laughs> I wanna get that building, put that incubator on that corner as a beacon of hope and to also say, we're gonna erase these red lines. We're gonna turn the red lines to Paisley. We have opportunity, we have imagination, we can do it. That seats to shelves. Thank you. For your presentation. Um, uh, let me start with, um, your first milestone. So I know you talked about additional community engagement and focus groups, but when you think from a programmatic perspective, um, what's your first milestone? I think my first milestone is really gonna rely on the, grocer, the uh, growers um, to be, and I was told, I was advised by an advisor at Swetland did not even mention this, but I see collaborating with Lena. I see collaborating with, um, with Antonisia. These systems do not exist in a vacuum. And so to build a system, it has to be systematic. So my first challenge is going to be to really get growers on, on board. This has been tried in the past to do this collaboration. It's been fits and starts. Mm -hmm. So that would be my first milestone. Good, thank you. Um, and any sense for uh, kind of long-term goals, how many growers would you, would you seek to have? Oh boy, you know what? That's such a good question. And I, I don't know that it's the number of growers versus what outcome we're looking for. So in the business plan that where I'm at right now is figuring out year one, year two. I'm looking at this in five for five years. Mm -hmm. So for year one, if I can even just have a collaboration that holds together, have a truck up running, that's a mobile produce market that is supplied with produce that people want grown, not what you just have left over, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. And I would be getting a MacArthur prize instead of <laughs> 
Good. Um, I'm going to go off the, the question script and ask ask um, uh, a, a different one. How do you think about kind of the economic piece of you know what it costs to grow the produce locally, and then making that accessible from a financial perspective to uh, those residents that would be using the mobile food uh, farmers market? So looking at what others, so the local growers piece is most people, or many of the growers in my turf are in a, pro, a project called, um, I forget what it's called, but it's through OSU Extension, okay. Summer Sprout. Yeah, so they get seeds for free. They're not allowed to sell produce. So the, the first thing I have to do is figure out a way for them to carve out a piece of whatever land they're farming on and then have a supply for the, for the seeds to grow. Um, the other piece is, I'm sorry, tell me the other part of your question. It, it was really around um, kind of the economics of growing the food and then making sure it's accessible. to the Yes, yeah, the exactly. So I talked to the, the, the mobile farmer's market that I really am enamored with is in Boston and it's called About Fresh and they've been operational for a number of years. They're now operating, I think, three mobile markets and they're about to do their fourth. So I asked them that exactly, how do, we, how do I make this accessible? So they told me about their margins and that's some stuff I'll learn when I do my onsite training, but they talked about their margins and that even with their margins, they're selling at 50% lower than any place else. So I, it would, we would have to be able to accept SNAP, um, EBT, um, 100%. There would have to be some way to have perhaps some things underwritten, but this would not be just for people who can't afford it. So the people who can't afford it would still like to have this wonderful, beautiful produce that comes to your neighborhood and that can help subsidize folks who can't afford it. Sure. If that makes sense. The economic piece for the farmers too is they mm -hmm. will get a piece of whatever sold. Mm -hmm. So that goes back into helping them add their wallets and also to grow more stuff. Yeah, and much, much cheaper to, to move the produce around the corner than it is to ship it across the country. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now, one thing they do do in Boston though that surprised me is they, when they can, they do local but they use, they have a wholesalers that they get the food from and they get deliveries fresh every day, so. Good. Um, what do you see as your biggest obstacle? Oh, Lord, <laughs> Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yesterday, last night, I was at a, a, a conversation at the West Side Market, which I consider to be our biggest asset next to Lake Erie. They're, they're even like this to me. The lack of movement on new ideas, there is a resistance to grassroots involvement that I've never seen anywhere that I've lived. And I've been as an army brat all over the world, like on Tunisia. Um, it, it's, it, it is really this mentality. Fortunately, this is an election year. We may get some fresh blood in and we can have these conversations. So the biggest obstacle will be getting around you know, just dealing with not just city hall, but just the, the there's sort of this entrenched thing about Cleveland that that is resistant to change, a little suspicious. Um, so I'm getting like the red light <laughs> from this one right here. Um, well, th thank you, though. That was thank really you so great. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Chef Kelly and I'm here to cultivate your culinary curiosity. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> so I am a self-taught chef. I was born and raised in the Glenville area of Cleveland, Ohio and my culinary curiosity was sparked by my grandmother. Just sitting in the kitchen, having conversations with her while she was cooking, she was teaching me educate me and sharing ideals. So I wanna share my curiosity and my culinary experience with everybody. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite little quotes. Cooking from scratch is the single most important thing we could do as a family to improve our health and our general well-being. So with this said, let's move on to this problem that we have. We know there's a lack of knowledge and education. 
We know that families are being misinformed. We know there's a lack of income and money. We know that we have single parent households. We know that the ability and the time to prepare homemade foods. We know that we don't have the supplies and the equipment to do these and the stores and the grocery stores and the inner city don't offer us all the same thing. So with this being said, we talked a little bit about the problem. I wanna share a little quick story. Um, I work at a jazz club and at this jazz club, one of my coworkers there, she's a young girl, she has a son and she was telling me about, well, we like to talk about food. So she comes in the kitchen sometimes and she's like, oh, what are you cooking? Oh, I would like to cook that. And she likes to say, oh, I have this at home, but I don't have that. Like, what can I do? So I like to share little recipes or little, little improvisations that you can do with food and cooking to help her out. And she told me a story about, I would love to cook from scratch and help uh, cook scratch cook with my son, different things like that. She said, but I don't have the time. I said, I understand. And then she said, so, you know, today I ordered him a pizza, but we could have had a lot more fun making this pizza together from scratch. Then we talked about money, equipment, the tools. You know, sometimes people out here don't have electricity, water, gas. The simple things that we know that, you know, most of us have at home and we can go home and just prepare these meals. A lot of people don't have these things. So I would like to try to fix this problem. I can't do this alone. I need your help. So with this problem, I would like to um, cultivate culinary curiosity amongst the children and their family I would like to expand their palates and promote family connection around healthy eating. And how can I do this, you ask? Well, one way, I would like to start with the kids because the kids will get your attention. So what I would like to do is spark the kids' attention. I would like to uh, introduce and teach them to different fruits and vegetables. Send home these products of fresh produce and recipes with these families. And ask these kids to cook these uh, recipes, try these recipes out with their families and send some feedback. So I piloted with the music settlement. Shout out to Karen Heitlinger, Heitlinger, Chair of Early Childhood. And I created a recipe card. As you can see, this recipe card is pretty simple. You only need like two ingredients, maybe 15 minutes of your time. We got plantains. I walked into a classroom. I had a whole bunch of plantains. I asked these four-year-olds, I said, what is this? They said, a banana. I said, no, this is not a banana. They was like, oh, it's not. You don't know what you're talking about. I was like, no, it's not a banana. I gave everyone one, told them to hold it. They said, well, it's a little bit bigger than a banana. I asked them to try to peel it. They said, we can't peel it. This is a very strong banana. <laughs> I said, it's not a banana, it's a plantain. So by the time I convinced the kids it was a plantain, they was extremely curious about this particular plantain. They wanted to get inside. They wanted to see what it tastes like. They wanted to cook it, sent it home with them. Now it's on their parents. <laughs> so I sent this plantain home with the, with, with the parents. This, I would like to explain to you, Briefly, but I do want to go back to my story uh, about sending those plantains home with the kids and I'll let you see what happened. So I've sent home these recipes with the families, but I also would like to connect QR codes because the world is changing. I know if you've been to a restaurant lately, you didn't get a menu, you got a little QR code to scan, came up on your phone. So what I would like to do is have QR codes in grocery stores, we'll have links to uh, these recipes on how to use different produce in the grocery stores. So we're going to spark your curiosity, send home recipes, connect them with QR codes. Now you're cooking with your family. 
and we're also having fun. And you know, cooking with kids is not just about the ingredients. It's not about the recipes. It's about harnessing your imagination, empowerment, and your creativity. So here I am with my students at the music settlement, trying to convince them that that planting was not a banana. And I would like to share this video with you guys, uh, some feedback that I got from one of my families. All right, so with this being said, I need your help. I need local shops. I need the grocery stores. I need somebody to help me out with this uh, social media website because like Michelle said, I don't know nothing too much about that. So come on, you guys, help me out. <laughs> and if you guys would just like to read that slide, it's one of my favorites. Chef Kelly, that was that was awesome. The video really <laughs> spoke to me, and it was really Thank fun you. too. Um, I'm going to go off the question script, and okay. you, because you sparked my uh, culinary <laughs> curiosity, and I'm I'm curious, what's your favorite meal to prepare for you and your community? I don't have a favorite meal. I like to go into the grocery store and find something that I have no clue like what to do with it. And I like to bring it home, research it, and prepare something from that particular meal. Yeah. Have you, and, and it looks like you've created um, some recipe cards. Have those sort of been sparked from that creativity and going into the, the grocery store to find something unusual? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, with the kids, you, you can find things like dragon fruit or, I mean, simple as a plantain and a banana, things that they may have not tried. I asked uh, a few of the four-year-olds, I had one of my coworkers, I said, take your grandson to the grocery store and just walk through the produce department and ask them a few questions about what this is and what is that. And so, of course, he said, oh, this is a banana. He knew oranges, he knew apples, but she was a little bit embarrassed to say he didn't know what a um, honeydew melon was or a cantaloupe. So she's like, oh my God, I have to feed him different things because he didn't know this. So. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I have, I have a couple of young kids in my own. <laughs> it's always fun trying new food. Um, well, so and it looks like you've, you've done some incredible work already with the music settlement. Mm -hmm. What's, what do you think your first milestone is um, that you need to accomplish? Well, my milestone is that I need to accomplish would be to um, get some help with uh, social media and connecting with these chefs to get more food cards made and you know, some simple cards. Like I really think these recipe cards have to uh, be simple to easy. Like a recipe that you create with just maybe one item at home. Yeah. Or if you want to go a little bit further, then you can have more utensils or ingredients that you need to add. Mm -hmm. Would and and in, in addition to the music settlement, who do you hope to partner with, and and what might motivate them to engage with this work? I would love to partner with some of my fellows. Uh, I would love to partner with local chefs. I would love to partner with the food bank um, because they're passing out food to uh, the community. And we've also talked about food waste. A lot of the food in the boxes, uh, a lot of people don't know what to do with it. So let's give them some recipes. Let's give them some ideas. Let's give them some QR codes to connect them to information on how to use this particular produce. Mm -hmm. What, what obstacles do you anticipate getting in your way? Obstacles. I don't believe in obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll flip the question. <laughs> um, how, do, how will you know when you've succeeded? How will I know when I succeeded? When I can walk into grocery stores and I can see QR codes in the produce department. When I can walk into the inner city grocery stores and see fresh produce. Um, just the same as if I walk into um, Whole Foods, I can walk into 
maybe a save a lot or somewhere and actually see the same type of produce mm -hmm. offerings. That's great. How, how do you know that your transformation proposition is wanted in, in your community? I mean, I've talked to people, the story that I shared about the young girl that works for me, you know, mm -hmm. she would love to cook for her son. She would love to try different things. But when you have certain obstacles, and I just said, I don't believe in obstacles. So if there is a workaround, um, you know, there is a need because she's, she's trying, she wants to do better. But when you have like food stamps, you can't go buy all of these ingredients. And so that's why I would like to also teach you on how to preserve, um, how to repurpose your food so that you can have better use of it. That's great. Um, and what, do you, what are your long-term goals? You talked about having the QR uh, codes in the grocery stores and really connecting in schools. What do you hope to see um, change in, in communities? I really hope to see like home ec and life skills ball back into the school system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're teaching, uh, starting young, teaching people how to survive, teaching them life skills. Well, I'd love for you to teach my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. Thank you. I have not a clue on how to work this. So easy, wasn't it? <laughs> Mind, body, and spirit. Oh, I think I'm doing the wrong thing. Hit the next. Good morning. My name is Marilyn Burns. I'm a community leader and advocate and I'm also a resident of Woodhill Homes. For those of you who are not familiar with Woodhill Homes, Woodhill Homes is public housing. I've been a resident of public housing for 18 years now. And how I became a resident of Woodhill Homes because I was a homeowner. I always grew up in uh, residential areas, pretty nice residential areas, but I became a victim of a scam. Becoming a victim of a scam, I lost my home, I lost my bank account, and I lost a relationship with one of my children who has now passed on to heaven. In 2011, I lost my son, and what he said to me was, Mom, how could you ever live in a place like this? I will never ever come back. In the process of him, Saying that to me, my son passed away, which left me devastated, broken, and just didn't know what to do. And in all of this, I was looking at the community I was living in and I saw all their disparities. So I threw myself into community work to rebuild my spirit. So in my initiative, the Mind, Body, and Spirit Initiative, I set out to seek to help people who live in undeserved, under-resourced neighborhoods, particularly in public housing community, and by offering them something to rejuvenate their spirit by using a food as a healer to help them navigate through all of this. But in order to do this, we must rejuvenate the spirit. That is the foundational piece of every human being on this planet. The spirit is the foundation of what we do. How do you expect anybody to eat healthy if they don't feel good about themselves? They either go from one extreme to the next. Some people overeat. I had a neighbor who just gets a big gallon of ice cream and sits there and eat it, to a neighbor who just refuses to eat anything at all. Why? because they are broken in spirit. And this is my approach to the food system change. Often when I look at this, we have to build a sense of connectedness to heal. We have to have a sense of rejuvenation of the spirit, a restoration of the spirit, 
in order to build the reconnectedness. And in reconnecting each other, we empower each other because we're building, we're all connected. When I look at all of this as well, I'm often reminded of a quote from the Bible from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. Also in one version of that, we are cast down, but we are not cast out. We fall down, but we get back up. So in this, I do this in my neighborhood because we need a rejuvenation of the spirit. We cannot survive without this. So through this, over the 18 years that I have lived at Woodhill Homes, I've had the opportunity to engage with neighbors every single day of my life. There is not a time that I live out, leave out of my apartment without running into someone who needs what? Their spirit to be fed. So I partnership with Woodhill residents. I also partner with local ministries, city council, our council person, Blaine Griffin is a big champion of mine. He's always willing to help me out, especially when it comes to Woodhill Homes. Because the first thing out of his mouth is, it's about the kids. What are we gonna do about those babies? I live in a family estate. Over 700 plus people and the majority of them that they are there are children. So we feed the spirit of the children first because why, as Whitney Houston used to sing, the children are our future. And this is what we have to learn and lean to as time goes on. I also partner with city architects, local universities. I speak all the time to first year medical students, not only from Case, but from Cleveland Clinic. They are so eager to learn about communities such as where I come from and live in because they want to know what I do and what it does and how it helps the kids. And they are eager because this is a side of society that they have never seen. We have to remember, as one of my fellows said earlier, where I live is one of the major red line communities. We're talking about a situation that goes back to the 1930s. It is now 2021 going into 2022 and not much has changed, okay? And that is so broken. So we're talking about not only historical, generational, but we're talking about societal traumas. We're talking about stigmatization. We're talking about people who have been demoralized. So this is what I'm looking for like-minded people. If you work on the spirit first, the mind and the body will definitely follow. Through this, I had some videos, but the ways to support is through funding, donations, volunteering, and community change. I want to leave you guys with something that is so profound and I wanna feed your spirit before I close today. And it goes, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Well, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that others won't feel insecure around you. Uh, we were born to make manifest the glory of light that is in all of us. It's not just in some of us, but it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Please let your light shine. Please let your spirit be fed. And please try to become a part of this group that is trying to uplift our communities through the spirit. I thank you. Miss Marilyn, your light has truly shown for so many years and I'm a little starstruck um, sitting here getting the chance to ask, ask questions of you and as you share our wisdom with us. So thank you. Um, I, 
uh, and and I, I just I think that your holistic approach resonates with so many in this community and thinking about um, hope and and spirit really starting first. I'm curious in a um, tangible way, what do you see as your next steps and and your first milestone um, towards your work? Okay, I've made so many. Actually, you know what, the seven minutes were nearly as long. I had a couple of videos involving children, but I see my milestone as just the continual growth of the enthusiasm, of the openness, because if we all build this all on trust and more and more every day, the community has opened up to me. Miss Marilyn, when are you giving another event? Miss Marilyn, when are you doing this? Miss Marilyn, do you have, I am the resource. I am just a vessel. I, I want you all to take with you. I'm just a vessel of somebody who is using me. I'm very humbled by the work and by what I can bring to the community and to people that's not, it's in my neighborhood, but into the city and hopefully grow into the state. I want this to grow because we are living in a world right now that is truly broken in many ways. And we need a restoration of the spirit in order for anything else in our world to work. That's beautiful. How, how do you, as you think about growing this, this real movement, um, mm-hmm. how do you see this working and building um, with other food system efforts already taking place in the area? I think, it, I think it's connecting. And why I see that, I see the change every day in my community because just to walk in a room and you, you smile, just to do simple, small things, it, it, it catches on. Uh, it's infectious. And all these things that come from a positive nature, come from a good spirit, it can't help but to spread. It's like throwing a a stone in a pond, that rippling effect, it just keeps going, going and going and going. And this is what I see. I see this happening for our world and for our cities, for our community, for our children, for society. You you mentioned festivals, and I, I think I saw in one of your slides a harvest fest. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Sure. Uh, I did, uh, well, the Harvest Fest actually isn't coming up until October, but I've done so much. I did it just a couple of them recently. I did something trying to surround the food system change, and I had posters, everything of fruits and vegetables, because I partner also with the food bank. And a lot of times that one of my fellows said this morning that is happening in our communities, the food waste. So in order to put this process on, I have pictures and put your little stick knows what is it you like what do you want to bring put just that why do you like this and so I can share this information with the food bank listen this is what the community is asking for more of still bring the things that you are bringing but bring a little less of this then as we gradually grow I have partnered with my I'm just starting actually a nonprofit. we're starting an organization of nonprofit association so that we can partner with people who have resources that one doesn't have so next first example of that is I met a young woman who has a food kitchen a mobile food kitchen. How awesome is that? So when food is delivered through the food bank, you can use that kitchen. You can take a kitchen to the community. How about that? They can engage in the cooking process. You can take what you get from the food bank. You can do these little simple recipes. You can have the recipe card. Not only that, a a resident can engage in that cooking process. So hands-on is such a big ingredient in everything. So you get the card, you're able to take this home. I would like to do this to grow into so much more because come on guys, listen. I live in a one bedroom apartment. I have so much storage. My daughter came over there and she said, mother, where's your apartment? Because this looks like a storage unit. So with the help and the funding of organizations such as yourself, I can have a place where I can store things. I can have tables, chairs, tents. I can have culinary equipment. For those residents who may have a disability with their hands, why not give them a culinary kit? Something that this incentive will grow because I gotta tell you, not bragging, but Miss Marilyn, I have people walking up to me and say, when are you giving another event? 
I have children walking up to me and say, Miss Marilyn, I love you. You know that cooking class we did? Well, I went home and I shared this recipe with my mother, me and my mother. But the smile on their face was so infectious. And this is the things that I want to resonate through the community because you know how much a smile can light up a room, how much a smile can change your whole spirit of being. Thank you. Well, you've certainly changed our spirit of being. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're no, no longer using slides. Um, we are going to allow our reviewers to be excused for a moment so they can um, review what they, uh, how they've been seeing and thinking about these presentations. But I wanna just start off before they head out and say, wow, oh my goodness, what? You know, we're a research center at Case Western uh, with the Swetland Center, and we're really good at doing research. That's our comfort zone, right? But our community fellows, members of our um, Food Nest team have said, yes, we'll come and work with you in your space, and you're going to work with us in our space. And this fellowship, I think you can clearly see, pushed us to think about how do we translate these really great ideas into action? Because if it's just an idea, it's good, it's interesting, and we can maybe talk about it. But if it doesn't translate out into change, into making a difference in the community, you know, what do we have to say for it? So I just want to say thank you, fellows, for leading the way. Um, for your visions, and, and all, if you're not familiar with these five women, many of you are, many of you online are, you know these are leaders in our community. They've been doing great work far before this fellowship program, and they will do great work moving forward. Um, and so thank you so much, and I am just in awe of your work, and it's just been a joy to get to know you. In a minute, we'll come back, um, but while we're waiting for our reviewers to do their Dis deliberation. If you guys want to hop out for a minute, you can. I did also want to take the moment now to personally thank our fellowship training team. The conceptualization of the Food Systems Change Fellowship began in the fall of 2020, again, you know, on Zoom meetings, uh, through extensive conversations about each and every detail of this process from how will we recruit and how will we select and how will we train and what will a pitch even look like and our fellows can tell you the building the plane while we're riding it we were building while we're riding and they were co-generating this training program with us i do want to offer a special thank you to the members of the food nest team who served as our core training team for the 2021 cohort they committed countless hours, endless huddles, uh, behind the scenes support to organize the fellowship and the showcase today. Um, some of them are here today and I'm gonna ask them to come up and others are with us virtually. Uh, so if I call your name and you're here, come up, but I'll, I'll go um, down a list. So first I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Jill Clark from the uh, Ohio State University. Jill is on the virtual presentation. She's an associate professor at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs. Second, I would like to acknowledge Sheena Frierson. <laughs> Sheena is the coordinator of the Food Systems Change Fellowship Program. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we'll have our team, if you, you can go back down or if you want to go back down and come up. Um, <laughs> next, I'd like to acknowledge Brooke Kale, the program manager for the Food Nest Study. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, next, I would like to acknowledge Rachel Summer, the Director of Partnerships and Operations with the Swetland Center. I'd also like to acknowledge Gwen Donnelly, a pre-doctoral fellow with the Swetland Center who might be online, but Gwen had a baby about two weeks ago. So she is home enjoying her brand new baby, Mira. Um, I'd like to acknowledge India Gill, another pre-doctoral scholar with us on the project. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Rebecca Schulte, who is also online in Colorado. She's a Swetland Center summer intern and did a lot of the work in getting the slides and everything prepared for today. So please join me in thanking this amazing team. And now I'm gonna turn the show over to Sheena, who's going to share more details about the uh, last little bit of our showcase for today. It's hard coming after Miss Marilyn, I'm sorry. I'm glad I had an opportunity to get my cries out. So um, good afternoon or good morning. My name is Sheena Frierson. I am the coordinator of the Food Systems Change Fellowship. And I would like to congratulate the fellows for the work that they have put forth in delivering such amazing and impactful pitches to promote food systems change in their respective communities. It has been a pleasure serving as the coordinator in this capacity and having the opportunity to engage with each fellow as they share their passion to promote food access, spiritual wellness, professional development, agricultural entrepreneurship, and family engagement. And I'm excited to see the next step in their vision. Uh, therefore, the sponsorship meetings are extremely important for our fellows. Again, following the receipt of awards, there will be two opportunities for sponsors to meet with the fellows individually to answer questions and hear more about their project. Those uh, meetings are at 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. I would also like to thank our mentors for their time and added value to the visions of the fellows. I would like to also thank the reviewers. Um, for their time and dedication to the evaluation process and the feedback that they will be able to provide our fellows. And I'd like to uh, thank the attendees, of, attendees and those of you who are supporting in the virtual space and participating in the voting process for the People's Choice Award. So with that being said, I would like to begin the award ceremony, starting with the Food Systems Change Showcase Award. Um, each fellow will receive uh, a $500 appreciation for their active participation in our fellowship. I do see that our, our reviewers are not back yet, so we can pause, okay. <laughs> No, don't. I'm, uh, this is being recorded. <laughs> Two minutes. Okay, yeah, let's share the experience because I'm glad we are here. I have been inspired by these black women in the fellowship. Extremely inspired. They are doing work in red line communities. Um, I grew up in Cleveland and it's just really inspiring to see the work that they've been doing. And I know we've already mentioned this, but they have been doing this work for years. And I'm very excited to see what this program could do as we move on into the next uh, part of their journey. So 
those sponsorship meetings are very important. I really hope that um, people stick, stick around and really, you know, ask those pertinent questions so that they can get that the partnership that they need to continue those visions. It's been a great experience. And I've already said that so many times uh, to them personally, but I just want everyone to know in the virtual space that I really enjoyed working with the fellows this, this uh, six months. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah. Thank you, Sheena. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. This has been really such an awesome experience for me. I'm a pre-doctoral student, so um, I also have, I'm an entrepreneur, so being able to be in, the, in this research and entrepreneurship role here is just a really oper awesome opportunity for me. Um, I really enjoyed getting to know you, Ms. Lena and Ms. Marilyn and Michelle and Antonisia and Kelly. And to see your growth is just awesome. It's really awesome. It's, I've been really glad to be able to offer my help and to see you all. Your presentations today is just amazing. So I'm really proud of everyone here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I see that our reviewers are back. So I would like to invite the president of Brent Line, Dejon Brent, to the stage, please. Oh, I see you coming. Okay. <laughs> Hey, how you guys doing? You know, it was, it, was a, it was a blessing to be here, to hear all you guys. You guys are genius. Like this, I, I didn't expect that. Like it's some really great ideas and y'all guys really speaking to where I come from. So, you know, it really hit home and touched my heart. And you know, it, yeah, it's a real honor to be here. So um, I represent an award to a special woman. She's, I believe she's like a genius. She, she's very well spoken and She's very powerful and passionate about what she's what she's doing, and, and I stand behind it. I really believe in it. So I would be presenting to um, Antonisha Harris, uh, the Full System Change Showcase Award. Thank Next, I would like to invite Colleen Walsh to the stage. Hi, thank you so much. It's really been an honor to be a part of this because this was really amazing. You guys did a great job, like I was blown away. So I'm presenting the Food Systems Change Showcase Award to Lena Boswell. Lena. I, your linking of your work to the ancestors and to the land and all that meaning was so amazing. And I think that you should be commended for that. All your ancestors should be thankful for that. I think the way that you speak to um, the passion in this and how you tell the story of it is really important. And I just commend you for all the work you continue to do. I would love to hear more in the future. We can talk about sort of land as reparations and thinking about what that means and how we can get the land for you to grow on in the future as we move on. So, um, so yes. So I think it's um, really good. So congrats and thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask Eric Fiala, head of corporate social responsibility at eBank. So I think we are officially at afternoon, so good afternoon. Um, and I am pleased to present the Showcase Award to Michelle B. Jackson. <laughs> um, and Michelle, I just wanna say, we really enjoyed your, your presentation. I think a couple of things that really stood out. One was, um, love the use of, um, of data on historical redlining. I think seeing the maps and then just understanding how that still persists today is, is really critical to understand the change that's needed. Um, it's clear how much you know your community, um, how embedded you are. And I love this idea of culturally curated um, uh, food. I'm the, the father of four young kids. 
um, and the culturally curated food in my house is mac and cheese. Um, <laughs> but I'd love for them to get exposure and, and you know, have an opportunity um, to expand their palates. And, and I, I love that work. I think in terms of um, uh, some areas of opportunity, I would just say, I, I think maybe uh, a little bit more of the community engagement piece up front, some of the focus groups that you talked about doing, just to make sure that the community is bought in and is willing and ready to, to stand ready to support you. But um, thank you so much. Awesome job. And finally, I would like to ask Adrian Mundorf, Vice President of Programs and Strategy at, C at Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland. Hi, everyone. There's so much energy in this room. And though there's only, you know, 30 or so people, we could really feel it. And it was really inspired by um, who Darcy uh, commented as natural leaders and innovators. I have the pleasure of um, presenting this award to Chef Kelly Etheridge. And it was just, I was really blown away by your ability to weave in your personal story and connection to your own history and your grandmother about uh, cultivating uh, culinary curiosity. And I think, I mean, you've already done a lot of the legwork to connect with the music settlement and test this idea with, with young people and with their parents and get a chance to get feedback. And I think that's an incredible step in your journey to really making this a reality. So congratulations. <laughs> and I, I already mentioned uh, previously that I was a little starstruck by getting to um, interact with Ms. Marilyn Burns. And, and now I get the honor of presenting um, this award to you for your, your incredible um, ingenuity and, and leadership in, in your community. And, and truly, I, I think what, what I think people recognize across this community is you start with relationships and, and trust and really take it from there. And your holistic sense of, of really connecting that mind, body, and spirit, you know that's true. And uh, the rest of us are kind of catching up and learning that. And I think you've, you've really built um, your idea on, on that idea, on this idea of a holistic approach. And I think you're gonna take it really far. So congratulations. Thank you to our reviewers. Next, I would like to ask Eric Fiala back on the stage to present the winners of the Key Bank Reviewers Award. This award is based off the reviewer's scores. Two fellow, fellows are eligible to win $1,250. Great, thanks again. Well, as you can imagine, um, uh, the judges took a little bit longer, the reviewers took a little bit longer because it was such uh, such a hard decision given the, the phenomenal quality of presentations today. Um, and I'm uh, uh, quite honestly very grateful that there are two awards because we would have been in there another half an hour if we, uh, if we had to boil it down to one. Um, so our first uh, KeyBank Reviewer's Choice Award goes to Ms. Lena Boswell. Um, so... All right, and our second KeyBank Reviewer's Choice Award, uh, we present to Miss Kelly Etheridge. Finally, I would like to ask Dejan Brent back on the stage to present the Veals People's Choice Award. This award is based off votes from the supporters that are here in the audience and viewing virtually. All right, the Veal Institute People's Choice Award, award will go to Lena Boswell. Ooh, 
I'm gonna have to come up with four other fucking things. (laughs) This concludes the 2021 Food Systems Change Showcase of Opportunities. Again, I would like to thank the virtual supporters and our in-person audience fellows, reviewers, fellowship mentors, event co-sponsors, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History for hosting, and the Food Nest 2.0 funders. Thank you for coming and or logging in and enjoy your lunch. And we hope to see some of you at our sponsorship meetings.